Well, hey, ACF, I'm uh, glad to be back here with you guys tonight going through 1 Peter chapter 5, and I think we're actually going to finish the book tonight. So that's kind of an exciting feeling when you get to finish a book together. So let me pray, and then we're going to jump right into it. Father, thank you that we get to be here together. Lord, that we get to read your word and study it. God, that, and that, Lord, that you would call us to be a part of your kingdom and your family, Lord, and be the recipients of your truth in your word. God, I pray as we listen that it would sink down into our hearts, God, and just take root, Lord. God, like your hands just taking root on our heart, Lord, and just, God, causing us to turn to you, Lord. Just as we talk about humility today, talk about being clothed in humility, God, I pray you'd help us just to lower our egos, Lord, and come under your mighty hand and just be submitted to you. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Boy, amen. I'm really excited for this passage that I get. And last time, you guys remember that Pastor Mark and Garrett, who's one of our elders here, and they talked about uh, what does it mean to be an elder, what does it mean to be a leader, coming from verses one through four. So we'll read that together just to get the context, and then we'll jump into uh, uh, verse five. It's where we'll pick up tonight. And uh, if you didn't listen last week, I'd encourage you to go back and listen to the podcast by Mark and Garrett. It was really good. So this is what it says. Chapter five, verse one. The elders who are among you, I exhort. I who am a fellow elder and a witness of the sufferings of Christ and also a partaker of the glory that will be revealed. Shepherd the flock of God, which is among you, serving as overseers, not by compulsion, but willingly, not for dishonest gain, but eagerly, nor as being lords over those entrusted to you, but being examples to the flock. And when the chief shepherd appears, you will receive the crown of glory that does not fade away. Verse five, likewise, you younger people, submit yourselves to your elders. Yes, all of you be submissive to one another and be clothed with humility, for God resists the proud, but gives grace to the humble. I love this book that Peter is writing. And I think as we finish it, we should remember the context that we started with, that this is written to early believers who stand for Jesus made them aliens and strangers in a pagan world. And these are Christians that are facing persecution. All right. It's possible that um, they were in Nero's persecution at this time. It's possible it's right before then. It's hard to know, but we know it's in that time frame. And if that's the case, things would be hard for them. And I love Peter Sardis. He's been writing this book, and as he wrote this book, and he exhorted them, and as it exhorts us, you just get the sense that Peter is remembering Jesus and the way that Jesus led and the way that Jesus loved people. And it comes out through verses 1 to 5, Peter's humility. And then also, just a quick note, I want you to see that he says, that he's also a partaker of the glory that will be revealed. And we're going to talk about why that's important tonight. But he encourages them to be leaders who are willing to serve, willing to oversee, not serving out of a have to, but serving in this leadership position as a get to, not for gain, but eagerly. It's not to be for their glory or for their you know, their building of their own kingdom or their pocketbook or whatever, however you want to look at it, but it's to be eagerly to serve the body, not lording over those people who are entrusted to you. When God calls you to lead in a ministry, he entrusts people to you. That's an important thought. It's easy to get caught up in numbers and all these things as you're doing ministry, but remember whatever God has brought, he has entrusted to you, and it's a big responsibility. Um... And he calls them to be examples of the flock. And I love that one because Jesus, the night when he washed his disciples' feet, he said to them um, that what I'm doing, you're not going to understand now, but you're going to understand later. And then when he did it, he said, this is an example for you. If I, your Lord and teacher and Savior, would wash your feet, you need to wash each other's feet. And I love how now Peter calls us as leaders in the church, specifically shepherds, but I believe it's for any leader in the church, to be an example for the flock, to be an example for others. Your life should be hard after Christ. And when people look at you, they should see the example of Jesus Christ. And it should be an example that they can follow. Like Paul said, follow me or imitate me, he said, just as I imitate 
Christ. And so that's the heart that you and I are to have. And when the chief shepherd appears, you will receive the crown of glory. There it is again, glory, that does not fade away. So what happens if you're not an elder in the church? Is there an exhortation for you in this passage as well? Well, Peter's thinking of all of us, as most pastors are when they're preaching. He's swinging for the fence. So Peter says this, verse 5, Likewise, you younger people, submit yourselves to your elders. Yes, all of you be submissive to one another and be clothed with humility. So Peter just got done exhorting the elders in the church. And now he spends around, he exhorts the younger people in the church. And some have taken this to mean uh, Peter is exhorting younger people to show respect towards older people in general. And I do believe that is valuable, and I do believe that it honors God. It's the right thing to do. But in light of the context of chapter 5, sorry, I got this hair. Hold on. I got this hair in my eye. Hold on. Okay. There we go. Um, in, <laughs> in light, still there. In light of... Uh, the context of the first few verses of chapter five, I think he's talking about submitting to the role of elders in the church. And back then, those would have been mostly older people anyways. And so Peter is saying, likewise, you younger people, submit yourselves to your elders, the church leaders. Yes, all of you be submissive to one another and be clothed with humility for God resists the proud, but gives grace to the humble. So he's got a couple exhortations here. First off, you and I are to be submitted to church leadership. And that's an interesting point. And I don't think we, we think about it really, we don't really think about it a lot when I, I, you know, I get plugged into a church and I hang out in a church and I go to small group and house church and my friends. And it's like a community, it's like a family. Uh, but God has also ordained leaders to be in the midst of that family who are to nurture and care and look out for the flock. And that's just the way God has set it up. And the role of elder is important. And part of the role of being an elder is spiritual correction. And maybe you've experienced spiritual correction in a really negative way. I got really good friends in the church here that the church they came from before, just, you know, the power of the leadership was abused. And that certainly is the case in some churches. But I really think God's heart here and what Peter's trying to communicate, especially through the first few verses, is that these elders are to be bringing correction. They're to be uh, bringing uh, maybe a rebuke a little bit out of a heart to see people grow in the Lord and grow in their faith. And I love our elders here. I think they do a good job of it. Um, one of the roles of the elders to make sure that no false doctrine is working through the church, and that is an important one, and it's something that elders have to be vigilant in doing. One of the other uh, things elders do is uh, looking out for the sheep, making sure there's nobody who would take advantage of the flock or harm the flock, and that's a heavy responsibility. Uh, and it's probably good for you to know that our elders take it seriously. I've been in a meeting with our elders where uh, the decision was made to ask someone not to come back to our church. And we don't advertise that a lot, but because they weren't safe towards families and they're making people feel scared. And uh, it's part of the burden of leadership in the church that God has given. And so Peter's exhortation to the body is, hey, be respectful, be submissive to these elders that God has appointed and placed in your life and placed in the church, knowing that they're there for the protection, the nurturing, and the growth of the body of Christ. That she could grow up into, uh, into the image of Christ, into all that God has for her. And uh, I want to read this verse to you guys because I actually love this. I have this great story. It comes out of Hebrews uh, chapter 13. He says it just a little bit differently, and I think it's valuable because maybe you're like, I don't really want to listen to the church elders or I don't like the idea of authority or submission. Look what Hebrews 13 says. Verse 17 says this, Obey those who rule over you. He's talking about elders, those who uh, um, oversee you, watch over you, lead over you. And be submissive for they watch out for your souls. That's the calling God has given these leaders in the church. That's a heavy responsibility that they are to watch out for the souls of the body. As those who must give account, let them do so with joy and not with grief, for that would be unprofitable for you. 
What is he saying? He's saying God has called these men to lead in the body, to shepherd, to steward, to watch out for people's souls and that they have to give an account, I think, to God about it. God holds them responsible for the way they led in the church. And so he's saying, hey, let them do so with joy. Don't be a, a bummer on them. You know, don't be the fighter if they come with, uh, with correction or a word of encouragement or, um, you know, pull you aside, say something, whatever. He said, hey, because this is why they're here. They're here to look out for your soul. So let them do it with joy. Don't, don't, don't make it like a grievance experience for them because that would be unprofitable for you. Because in the end, we're all equal at the foot of the cross and it's God's family. I remember uh, being a kid and uh, my, my older brother and my older sister, my parents would leave them in charge sometimes, um, which was good and bad. When my sister was in charge, it was total anarchy. She couldn't control it. So my brother was in charge things actually kind of got settled, but we're still siblings. We're still equal. But when mom and dad were out to dinner, they would leave someone in charge. And when that person came home, they would give it, when mom and dad came home, that person would give an account of how the night went. And if you were really bad and uh, disobedient and not listening and causing problems for the family while mom and dad were away, I, you got disciplined when mom and dad came home. Is it because my brother was lording over me? He was so much greater, better. No, it's just because Mom and dad had entrusted him to look after the family while they were away. And I kind of see that the same with elders. And that funny story I was going to encourage you guys with is uh, my youth pastor, he used to always quote that verse, Hebrews 13. He'd never remember to go to the bathroom before guys' discipleship. So we would wait for him to go in there. And then we had learned we could wedge um, like a plastic table just at the right angle that it would go under the doorknob and then pin down on the ground. And we'd just leave him in there. And he couldn't get out. And we would just knock on the door and we'd read him scriptures and laugh at him. And he'd be real patient. Then he would quote that verse to us and remind us that we would have to give an account. And he was right. Uh, the second exhortation he gives to us is being submissive to one another. So it's more than just, okay, you got to respect the leadership. He's actually saying you got to have respect for one another. In fact, he says the words that we need to be clothed with humility. So in the church, because we all have the spirit of God, because it is equal playing field at the foot of the cross, you and I are to be willing to be called out and corrected and learn from one another. If someone comes to me and, and they say, hey, what you're doing in your life, it's not good. I need to be willing to listen. In fact, this is backed up by many scriptures in the Bible that talk about you and I not thinking more highly of ourselves than we ought to. Or you and I choosing to take the low position and to prefer others over ourselves. That we're to have a humble mindset uh, like Christ did who left his glory in heaven to step down here on this earth to save us. We're to have, excuse me, the mind of Christ that we would be humble and united. And so he says you need to be submissive towards one another. Listening to one another, learning from one another. Be clothed with humility and uh I love that, that word there, it's speaking about the outfits that a slave would wear. Speaking about the apron or a scarf that the servant would wear in the household and it would distinguish him uh, as like a mark from, from a free man. So people would see him and they would know he was a servant. And some people believe that Peter, when he writes this, is actually remembering when Jesus girded himself Remember that story? And he washed their feet. We talked about at the beginning of the message. And I, I don't know if that's what Peter is referencing here. I like to believe that it is, that as he's writing these words of being clothed with humility, he's thinking of Jesus, putting on, you know, uh, girding himself as a servant and coming over and washing their feet and serving them. Peter says, guys, that's our example. That's how we're to treat one another with that kind of humility. It's to be our adornment, our mark that distinguishes us from others is to be our humility. What a powerful thought. He's going to back it up with more. For God resists the proud, but gives grace to the humble. God resists the proud, but gives grace to the humble. That word resists is a word that means ranged in battle against or arranged in battle. Who would want God to be arrayed in battle against them? I wouldn't. 
Peter's exhortation to the body is, is God resists the proud. The haughty spirit, that's not the one Isaiah says dwells with the Lord. No, it's the humble, it's the contrite, it's the broken spirit. David writes about uh, people and says it's the humble that God teaches in his way. God resists the proud, but he gives grace to the humble. The humble place is the place where grace is poured out. God's unmerited favor is poured out on the humble place. I think this is, um, it's good for us to pause and think through because how quick are you and I to defend ourselves? How quick are you and I to blow our own horn, to exalt ourselves, to stand up for ourselves, to try and promote ourselves and move us forward? And yet Peter's saying in the church, that's the place God resists. You wanna see God arranged, arranged against you in, in battle? That's the place where you, you're gonna, where God's going to resist you and you don't wanna be there. In fact, pride is the original sin. It's what caused Satan's downfall. And the flip side of that, it's the lowly place. It's when you and I choose to humble ourselves that God's grace and favor is just unhindered on us. And he keeps building this thought. He says, therefore, humble yourselves under the mighty hand of God that he may exalt you in due time. What's the exhortation then? If God resists the proud and he gives grace to the humble, well, then you should humble yourselves under God's mighty hand. I love that picture of God's big hand shadowing you and I. It's a good reminder of, of who God is and how big he is and how small you and I really are. And Peter says, hey, the place of grace is coming underneath that big hand, that mighty hand, letting it overshadow you, humbling yourselves before God and just waiting on him, knowing that God is going to exalt you in due time. Jesus said something super similar in Matthew 23, 12. He said that whoever exalts himself is gonna be humbled and he who humbles himself is going to be exalted. That's how God does it. He lifts up the lowly. Paul says he uses the weak and the debased things and the insignificant things, I like to look at it, for his significant purposes. The weak put to shame the mighty, the, you know, he used fishermen that confound the wise. It's how God works and he gets all the glory and then there's no boasting because we can just boast in the cross. We can just boast in the Lord. And how hard this must have been and yet how comforting for these believers who are being persecuted. Can you imagine suffering and struggling unjustly for no reason other than your faith? You can imagine how hard it would be for them to receive this word, to humble yourself under God's mighty hand and, and just bear it and just take the low spot and be patient with one another. I bet you when persecution's going on, it's hard to listen to church leadership. It's hard to listen to one another because we're all suffering. And yet Peter says, you gotta take the low spot, the place where God's grace is poured out. That's where you gotta stay. And trust that in due time, that hand that you're humbling yourself underneath is going to scoop you up and exalt you and lift you up. What a beautiful picture. That mighty hand of God that you come underneath, the shadow of his hand, and then that hand is going to lift you up someday. And I love verse seven because it's a continuation of verse six because that feels like bittersweet medicine to you and I. And Peter adds on to it. He says that he may exalt you in due time, casting all your care upon him for he cares for you. Peter says, look guys, I know it's hard. I know you're suffering. I know you're um, going through the throes of it. You're being persecuted, maybe even being thrown to the lions at this point. We just don't know. And yet Peter says, Here's the remedy to that bitterness in this, this whole humbling ourselves and, and waiting on God. When it feels like God's taking forever, he says, you got to trust that God cares for you. So cast your cares upon him, the pain, the unfairness, whatever it is, the, the Lord, I could, I could stand up for myself. I could, I could defend myself. But instead, I'm going to take the lowly place. I'm going to roll this off on you and say, Lord, would you defend me? Lord, would you um, vindicate me? 
God, would you bring about what's true in the situation? Casting your care upon God. Literally, like the idea is like throwing, like casting it off onto the Lord because he cares for you. And I think that's a subtle point that you and I are so quick to forget in our walk with God, that he cares for you and I. Do you remember when the disciples woke Jesus up in the boat because it was sinking? They're like, Lord, do you not care that we are perishing? And I remember a reading a commentator saying that that's where they went wrong. Was it wrong to be scared in the storm? I mean, Jesus was in the boat. You could go back and forth on that. Like, we get afraid. They should have trusted Jesus. It's, it's normal for you and I in our fallen state to feel fear. Was it wrong that they woke Jesus up and said, Jesus, help us? Probably not. But it was wrong when they accused him of not caring. And they said, Lord, do you not care that we perish? Like, you just don't care, Jesus. <laughs> Guys, and yet how fast are you and me to say the same thing? God, you just don't care. That's why I feel like I have to defend myself because if you cared, Lord, I wouldn't be here. And yet maybe God is asking you and I to humble ourselves under his mighty hand. Maybe God is allowing you and me to be brought low so that he can teach us something in the moment so that when he exalts us, we're gonna be in a different place. We'll be ready for it. I don't know, but I do know that sometimes God allows us to be humble. And when we do that, it teaches us such great perspective. And so Peter's exhortation to humble yourself under God's mighty hand and just, and just be submitted, be surrendered to him, to leaders, to accountability to others in your life. Just bear it and, and know that in due time, God's going to lift you up. And in the meantime, with all the pain and frustration, th- roll it off on him, cast it off on him because he genuinely cares for you and me. And maybe that's a word for you tonight. Maybe you're someone who's been suffering, depression, anxiety, I don't know. And you just need to know that God cares for you. You may feel like no one cares, but the reality is, is God cares. God cares for you and me. Charles Spurgeon said, if you are willing to be nothing, God will make something of you. I love that quote. I, in fact, I remember when one of my mentors told me, he said, Cody, if you're willing to do anything or everything, God can use you to do anything. It's the humble place where God's blessings poured out. That's also a powerful place where God can make something out of you and I and shape us and sculpt us and use us for his glory and for his purposes. And I love that. It's hard. It's hard (laughs) to humble myself, but good things happen when I do. Well, he's got more exhortations. He says, be sober. So humble yourselves, cast your cares upon God, be sober or um, have self-control. Be vigilant, be watchful. Why? Because your adversary, the devil, walks about like a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. Resist him steadfast in the faith, knowing that the same sufferings are experienced by your brotherhood in the world. Wow. Be sober, be self-controlled, be watchful. Why? On top of being humble, because your adversary, the devil, walks about like a roaring lion. What a, what a powerful encouragement. You know, we talked about it uh, in our revelation. Say so Satan's not your friend. His thoughts towards you are not good thoughts like God's thoughts. Satan wants to destroy your life. He's seeking whom he may devour. It's what he wants to do. And so because of that, you and I are to be self-controlled. We're to be watchful. And I wondered why. Why would Peter pick those two things to encourage us with? Well, let me be really honest with you. When Satan tempts me, a lot of times he comes with compromise, right? He comes with an area where you are weak, where he knows he can bring you into sin. And that's where that exhortation of self-control comes in. It's a fruit of the spirit. And Satan's like, hey, you should just do this, or hey, you should give in to this, or hey, you should say that, or you should act this way, or you should whatever, you should go cope this way. And he's baiting you in your weak spot. 
And Peter says, no, you need to have self-control. You need to have the fruit of the Spirit and say, no, I'm not going to let my flesh dominate. And I find that interesting. When Satan comes, he appeals to your flesh because your flesh is weak. But when God is appealing to you and me, he's talking to our spirit. In fact, he's put his spirit inside of us and he's reasoning with us and our spirit saying, hey, come walk with me. So Satan appealing to your flesh, Peter says, self-control. It's going to defend you. He said, be vigilant, watchful, watching for the enemy. He's a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. Let me ask you this. If you woke up one morning uh, before you went on your uh, daily jog, let's say you're a runner and you're going to go for your morning run and you read the news and it said, you know, breaking news, hungry lion seen in this neighborhood and it's your neighborhood. Do you think you'd be careful going outside? Do you think you would be watchful? If you knew there was a dangerous, hungry lion who's seeking whom he may devour that was loose in your city, loose in your neighborhood, in your community, wouldn't you be watchful? Wouldn't you be like, that's a good place for a lion to wait, you know? Come around, you see like the little dark corner and the little den and you see the little glowing eyes back there and, you know, kind of like the cartoon, you're like, that looks like a lion. And, you know what I mean? Like you'd be watchful versus being like, hey, I wonder what's in there. Let's go climb in. You know, who would do that? All right, that's what Peter's saying to you and me. Who would do that? All right, be self-controlled, be watchful, be aware. Satan's roaming around looking to make, take the advantage of you and I. In fact, this is why I think humility is such a big point for Peter because pride is an opportunity for the devil in yours and mine's life. When we're arrogant, when we're self-exalted, when we're prideful, all we're doing is giving opportunity for Satan to get in and work. He gets our flesh all riled up. Yeah, they are mistreating you. And yeah, you should this. And you know what? You should say that to them. You know what? They're not good enough. You should just quit. And, and he gets in there and it's an opportunity for him. And so resist him. Be humble. Cast your cares upon God. Be self-controlled. Be watchful. Check out what verse 9 says. Resist him steadfast in the faith. You got to resist Satan. I love what David Guzik notes on this, that those uh, two words or that, that word resist comes from two ancient Greek words, which means stand and against. You and I are to stand against Satan when he comes knocking. It's interesting that we're to flee from temptation, right? There's some temptations that Paul says, hey, hey you got to flee that. You got to be like Joseph with Potiphar's wife. You just got to run. But when it comes to dealing with the devil, we're told you have to stand against him, resist him in the faith, steadfast in the faith. Just like Jesus did when Satan comes knocking, he says, hey, Jesus, if you would just worship me, you don't have to go to the cross. You just worship me. I'll give you the kingdoms of this world. And Jesus says, not today, Satan. It is written, quotes the scripture, right? Stands against him. Worship the Lord your God and him only shall you serve. And we know from James that when we resist the devil, in fact, I'll just read that verse, he has to flee. Check out what James says. Just the book right before Peter's, chapter four, verse six through seven. James says something very similar to Peter. He says, um, but he gives more grace. Therefore, he says, check it out, the same thing. God resists the proud, but gives grace to the humble. And that's a quote. Um, either from Psalms or Proverbs, I, I can't remember right now. Verse seven though, therefore submit to God, resist the devil and he will flee from you. When you and I stand fast against the devil, he has no choice but to flee because greater is he who's inside you and me than he who's in the world. I remember in Revelation when they see the devil and they, re they see that, uh, that the devil was overcome by the blood of the lamb, the blood of Jesus Christ, his finished work over you and me and the word of our testimony. So when Satan comes knocking, the exhortation is to stand fast in the faith and be like, no, Satan, no. Nope, yeah, it may feel like nobody cares. It may feel like I'm being unfairly treated, but, but God cares and God sees and God will lift me up in due time. Yeah, I feel like going out and coping this way or doing that way, but you know what? God cares and God sees and God is going to vindicate me or he's going to comfort me or he's going to strengthen me to get through this. Resist him steadfast in the faith. 
knowing that your brotherhood or the same sufferings are experienced by your brotherhood in the world. And we talked about that on Sunday. So encouraging that uh, no one is going through this alone as a Christian. No soul stands alone. We're in this together. And it's so encouraging when you and I think about the generations upon generations of believers who have lived before us, who have gone through hard times, and our God, who is eternal, has taken them all through it faithfully. He's never failed one of them, not even once. And if God could do that for all the saints through eternity and all the saints presently, he can do it for you and me now. God's never dropped the ball. He has a perfect record. When you and I read about uh, Daniel in the lion's den and Shadrach, Meshach in the fire, it's the same God. The God who came to Job and spoke to him or the God who sprung Peter out of prison. It's the same God you and I serve. He's never failed his people and he's not going to start now. So you and I can be comforted by that knowledge. And this is what he says at the end. But may the God of all grace who called us to his eternal glory by Christ Jesus after you have suffered a while perfect, establish, strengthen, and settle you. To him be the glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. I got a few more thoughts. I know it's been a bit. I got a few more thoughts, and we'll call it there. Guys, Peter's prayer, his closing thoughts here, is that God, because remember they're in the midst of suffering, <laughs> so his prayer for them is that God, who is the God of all grace, by the way, what a comforting thought. Our God is just, he is holy, he is righteous, but to his children, he is also the God of all grace. To the sinner in need of a savior, he is the God of all grace, of all favor, of all things good, of all of his abundant mercies. He's the God of all grace. Peter reminds us of two things, he said, Hey, God is the God of all grace, and he's also the God who's called us to eternal glory. Remember I said that was important at the beginning of this message. Paul would write about it this way. He says, the sufferings you and I are facing presently are not worthy to be compared with the glory that is coming. The eternal glory. The sufferings you and I have right now, they're temporary but the glory that's gonna be revealed, the glory that you and I are gonna experience, that is eternal. So another bittersweet prayer, Peter's like, hey, may the God of all grace, everyone's like, yes, the God of all grace, who called you to eternal glory. Yes, he's called us to eternal glory. Amen, preach it, Peter. And then he says, after you have suffered a while. <laughs> what kind of a prayer is that? Perfect, establish, strengthen, and settle you. Guys, I don't much like it, but Peter knew something that all the old saints seem to know. And this is it right here. Whew. Ready? It doesn't seem comfortable in the moment when you and I suffer, when we're treated unfairly, when we have to take the low place and be humble. I don't like it. I'll be honest with you. I, I just don't. It's not comfortable. But in that present discomfort... God is creating a greater end result in you and me. It's the present sufferings, the light afflictions that are shaping you and I, getting us ready for the eternal glory that's to come. In fact, look at the outcome of, of being patient and suffering a little while, letting, letting Christ work in that. It's that you're going to be perfect you're going to be established, you're going to be strengthened, and you're going to be settled. Do you want Christ to do a deeper work in your life? I want that. And there's a day I'm gonna be perfect. It's not gonna be on this, it's not gonna be here on this earth, it's gonna be in heaven with the Lord when all my sin is removed and that flesh is put away. But someday I'm gonna be perfect. I, want, I long for that deep work. I long to be established. I long to be strengthened. I long to be settled. And Peter says, hey, all that, all that that Christ wants to do in you, character, hope, all these things the Bible talks about, God sometimes just chooses suffering to develop that in you and I. So his prayer for you and me, 
Remember he's the God of all grace. Remember he, that he's called us to eternal glory. And then after we've suffered for a little while, God's going to perfect, establish, strengthen, and settle you and me. I want you to think of this thought real quick, because I know we're wrapping it up. But it was in the moments of intense suffering that so many people saw God in a, in a way they never would have seen him before if they hadn't gone through it. Like the disciples in the boat. They're in a storm for their life. And when they saw Jesus, and when they saw Jesus come through, they were so amazed that they looked at each other and they said, who is this? I mean, they knew Jesus, they'd been with Jesus, but seeing Jesus come through for them in this intense storm, they looked at one another and said, who is this? Just overwhelmed by the wonder of Jesus and who he is. I think of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, we talked about them, or Daniel getting to encounter God in the lion's den or encounter God in the fire. What a powerful experience. Can you imagine actually walking with God in the midst of a fiery furnace? They never would have gotten there though if they hadn't suffered. Or Job, when God spoke to Job from heaven and he audibly heard his voice. How many of you have ever had an experience like that? Probably none of us. And yet it was that intense suffering that Job went through that led to that moment. So I'd encourage you and I, just hang in there. Humble yourself under the mighty hand of God. Remember, God's gonna reveal himself to you in new ways as you're suffering, in ways you otherwise wouldn't see him. And that final work that he's doing in you and me is worth our present discomfort. So then he writes, to him be the glory and the dominion forever and ever, amen. To God be the glory, the God who is big enough to bring you and I through these sufferings and to a far greater glory is worthy of all of our praise. And let's wrap this up. By Sylvanus, our faithful brother, as I consider him, I have written to you briefly, exhorting and testifying that this is the true grace of God in which you stand. She who is in Babylon, elect together with you, greets you, and so does Mark, my son. Greet one another with a kiss of love. Peace to you all who are in Christ Jesus. And there's a lot that could be said there at the end, and we just don't have time for it tonight. But if you ever get a chance, look at Mark's story. This is John Mark he's speaking of. And the guy has such a crazy testimony of uh, knowing the Lord from a young age, it would seem, and following him, and then kind of bailing on the Lord and to some degree, to the point that Barnabas and Paul would separate over him, if you know the story in Acts, and, and then restored down the road to ministry. It's a beautiful testimony. It's the kind of guy we'd want Garrett Flynn to interview on a podcast. It's a beautiful story. Look into it if you get a chance. Silas or Sylvanus here, possibly the guy that Paul traveled with, scribing this for Peter. The church in Babylon, um, she was in Babylon. It could be a cryptic reference to the church in Rome or Jerusalem, or it could be that Peter is actually writing from a place called Babylon. There's two different places referred to as Babylon in his day, but we don't know. But he ends with this final note, and that's where we'll leave it. Greet one another with a kiss of love. Peace to you all who are in Christ Jesus. Amen. So the love of Jesus Christ that you and I are to have for one another, that's supposed to identify us as his followers. Peter says, hey, make sure you love one another. And by the way, the kissing thing, that... He's not saying we actually need to go out and kiss each other. There are people who think that that's a little weird. He didn't make that up. It was already probably common practice in those cultures. In fact, maybe some of you guys have been in a culture or lived in a culture um, where kissing is a uh, greeting. I've lived in a culture like that. It was very uncomfortable the first few times, but you get over it. Um, so I don't think he's saying we actually need to kiss one another at house church tonight. I think he's just saying we need to love one another and then peace to you and I who are in Christ Jesus. God bless you guys. I love you guys. Go to your small group discussion time. Do not kiss each other. Um, may God's peace be with you. May you practice love and humility tonight as you walk and uh, talk in conversation. God bless you.